It's a great pleasure to um, welcome Professor Richard Norman. He is Emeritus Professor of Moral Philosophy. He is a founder member of the Humanist Philosophy Group and is a Vice President of the BHA. He is also Chair of the um, East Kent Humanist Group, so he's definitely one of us. And he has written and spoken extensively on humanism um, and allied subjects. Um, and so this evening is an ideal opportunity for people who um, are new to humanism or want to find out more about it or find out if indeed they are humanists to ask them. So we will have questions and answers afterwards. So um, without more ado, Richard. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be invited to, to, to speak to you to what's definitely one of the most thriving humanist groups. Uh, so it's great to be here, uh, and also one of the humanist groups that has um, uh, a better, what should we say, a better age spread than a lot of them, as, as he's uh, the chair of these Kent humanists, I can make that comparison. So very pleased to be here. Um, just before I go any further, do I need to do anything with this? Or is it, um... I can hear you fine. <laughs> yeah, but it's sort of pointing down to the table. But, um, I'm not sure. Uh, can you all hear the back? You can all hear yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> Um, the, the brief that I was given was slightly ambiguous as between um, talking about humanism in a general way and talking about on-humanism. Um, and if that sounds a bit convoluted, on-humanism is the name of uh, the book that I've written, which is, as it were, my take on humanism, of which there happen to be copies on the, on the table <laughs> over there. Um, um, so, so what I'm going to be doing is really a sort of combination of those two things. I mean, I'm not going to, as it were, talk about the book but I'm going to talk about humanism in the terms in which I discuss it in my book and from, from that perspective. So, at one level, uh, humanism is easily defined, I think. Um, indeed, Josh has got a very snappy definition of humanism on the bottom, bottom left-hand corner of the, of the display up here, uh, humanism being good without gods. Uh, and and the, the basic point, obviously, is the idea that Humanism is an attempt to articulate a positive view of the world, a positive way of life, which goes beyond the merely negative position of atheism or agnosticism. It goes beyond the negative rejection of religion and re rejection of belief in a god or gods to try to tackle the question of, more positively, how we ought to live uh, and how we can live a good life without religion. Once you start to try to talk about the, the positives, to articulate the positive dimensions of humanism, one of the questions that immediately arises, I think, is how much common ground there is between humanism and, and the world religions and, and religious perspectives in general. And that's one of the themes that I, uh, that I want to sort of keep an eye on uh, as, as I talk. Um, so that'll be sort of a recurring theme. Um, you know, as I go through the various dimensions of humanism that I want to talk about. But the four dimensions of humanism that I want to address, uh, and I'll give you for them first of all just as labels, are science, consciousness, morality, and spirituality. None of those headings will mean much for the moment, but I hope to explain what I, what I mean by um, each of those headings and in what sense each of those is an important dimension of humanism. So I start with science then. Um, because um, I'd certainly want to say that it's an important component of a humanist worldview, uh, uh, that, that it involves a commitment to the explanatory power of, of science and of scientific inquiry. Um, although, as I'll try to say in a moment, the relationship between science and religious belief is not a simple one, and not a simple opposition, nevertheless I do subscribe to the view that over the long term, scientific inquiry has superseded religion as um, uh, the explanatory framework which makes best sense of the world and our attempts to understand the world. So, so the commitment to science and scientific inquiry is certainly, I, I would say, central to humanism. But having said that, it's important, I think, not just to turn science into another religion, not just to... Um, um, uh, treat the invoking of, 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 of scientific understanding as just another appeal to authority. Now there is a problem here because most of us are not scientists, some of you may be, but I am not. Um, and most of what we know about scientific explanations and scientific theories, we depend 
we have to depend very much and take on trust um, um, the, 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 as it were, the received judgments, the, the accepted theories of, of modern science. And so there is an issue there uh, because you know, it's very tempting just to say, oh, well, scientists have shown. But why should we believe what scientists have shown any more than we should believe what anybody who claims to be, be an authority has shown? So what's very important for, for, for humanists, I think, then, is that although we're, you know, most of us are not scientists and don't do science firsthand, that we accept um, the going scientific theories as provisional theories because we have some understanding and commitment to the nature of scientific method and the nature of scientific inquiry. And what makes scientific inquiry an appropriate way of understanding the world is not simple and straightforward, I think. One of the things, one of the points that people typically, typically make is the strength of science is that it appeals to evidence and is based on evidence. And that's certainly an important part of scientific method. But it's not the whole story. If you think about the relationship between evolutionary theory and creationist stories about uh, the origins of the universe, for example. I mean, the, 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 the obvious thing to say is, well, you know, the evolutionary theory is based on evidence. Creationism isn't. But it's not quite so simple. There's the famous example of the 19th century naturalist Philip Goss, who, whose son wrote, wrote the book Father and Son, Edmund Goss. Uh, Philip Goss was, a, was a, a, an active naturalist. He was also a fundamentalist Christian. And at the time that evolutionary ideas were emerging, Philip Goss's response to that was to say, oh, well, it must be the case that uh, you know, the universe was created, just as it says at the beginning of Genesis, but God created it complete with the fossil evidence, exactly as we find it. And, of course, that, in a sense, is logically consistent um, with the creationist story. Um, um, it's, you know, that's one way of reconciling the creationist story with the evidence. The fossil, the fossil layers with, you know, with, with, with all, all the levels that, that, that evolutionary scientists appeal to were just how God created the universe in 4004 BC. So simply to say science is based on evidence is a bit too simple. And we need to look at other features of scientific inquiry as well. What's important, for example, is that science doesn't just consist in a whole series of, uh, of detached ad hoc hypotheses of the kind that Goss was putting forward there. Um, but science, science looks not just for theories that explain the evidence, but theories that do so in an economical way, theories that do so in a comprehensive and systematic way, that bring together different areas of inquiry and synthesize them under a unifying theory. One of the great strengths of the evolutionary theory, for example, is that it brings together the fossil evidence with what we know about um, domestic breeding of plants and animals, uh, and subsequently what we know about genetics uh, of modern biochemistry and the power of evolutionary theory, Darwinian evolutionary theory, consists very much of, uh, rests very much on the way in which it, it brings together those, those various different kinds of phenomena under a single unifying theory in a comprehensive and systematic way. What's also important about science is um, that it doesn't just offer plausible looking explanations, but it can, it can fill them out with detailed um, detailed mechanisms so that, for example, um, 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 increasingly as, as evolutionary theory develops, it can explain in, in detail how different species emerge, whereas uh, the appeal to divine creation simply you know, can't fill in the detail, it simply says, well, you know, God created it and that's all we can say. How it happened, we don't know, whereas the strength of science is that it can fill in the, the, the detail of the explanatory mechanisms. Now, I said just now um, that the relationship between science and religion is not a simple one, and it's very important to bear that in mind, I think. Uh, and clearly, the, the um, commitment to scientific method and scientific inquiry is entirely compatible with religious belief. You don't have to be a creationist if you're a religious believer. Uh, and, and most um, intelligent um, religious believers in this country um, um, are just as committed to the importance of science and the power of scientific inquiry. Not all, obviously, um, and, and um, um, less so perhaps in some other, other cultures than in ours, but, 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 but it's very important to recognize that you, know, that you can accept um, 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 science and the commitment to science and still be a religious believer. What 
such people would typically say, I think, is, well, of course, you know, of course we accept the findings of science and we're committed to scientific method, but science can't answer all our questions. And in an important sense, that's true, and I want to go on to, uh, in due course, say various, talk about various ways in which that's true, I think. But it's very important not to just use that slogan, science can't answer everything, as just a kind of... Um, uh, um, concession to the idea that so just anything goes. Yeah, okay, there are kinds of knowledge and kinds of understanding other than scientific knowledge and scientific understanding, but you still have to spell out what they are and why they are um, reliable uh, 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 and plausible kinds of understanding. Um, so for just to illustrate this briefly, um, many religious believers would say, well, of course, you know, scientific inquiry can explain how the various species of living things came into existence. It can explain how life originated in the first place. It can explain how uh, the, the various galaxies and stars emerged from, from the initial Big Bang. What it can't explain is how, how and why the initial conditions of the Big Bang were such as to produce the universe that we live in and that contains life on our planet. Uh, people sometimes refer this, to this as the fine-tuning argument. Um, that um, the initial conditions and the basic um, scientific laws had to be just right um, in order to produce the universe that came into existence. And what some, they sometimes say is science can't explain that. That's where scientific explanations come to an end. So that's where the only plausible explanation would be an appeal to divine creation. And that's where they bring in this sort of new version of the argument from design. But, but the general point to make there, again, is just because scientific explanation gives out at that point, as it has to, explanation has to stop somewhere, it doesn't follow that the theistic explanation is any better and it's any good at filling the gap. Uh, the fallacy there is to suppose, you know, if explanation of kind A gives out, then any old other explanation will be okay. Because that doesn't follow, obviously. So that's what I mean by saying that although science can't explain everything, we still have to be rigorous in thinking about what, what kinds of explanations are possible. Okay, that's my first point then, and that's, that's under the heading of science, the first important component of this is what I want to emphasize. Now, the second point that I want to emphasize leads on from that, because people sometimes say, well, if you really are committed to the scientific view of the universe, and in particular, the scientific view of human beings, that leads to a diminished view of what human beings are. Right? If, all we are if, if you think that science explains things, then you're committed to thinking that all we are is just bundles of particles, or just um, mere um, physical products of evolution, or just animals alongside any other animal species. It's what, what people sometimes refer to as the idea of reductionism. And critics of humanism and critics of atheists uh, worldviews often often say, but if you put all that emphasis on science, then you're just reductionist, um, and you can, can't give any um, recognition to what's special about human beings and what distinguishes us from, from the rest of the physical universe. So I want to say a quick word about this notion of reductionism. Daniel, the philosopher, American philosopher Daniel Dennett um, has a useful discussion of this, I think, and he distinguishes between what he calls bland reductionism, which is something that everybody ought to accept, and greedy reductionism, which is something that people ought to reject. And that's a useful distinction, I think. Bland reductionism is the recognition that, of course, um, um, uh, we are products of evolution, we are products of our genetic makeup, we are ultimately composed of physical particles, um, and none of the other things that we can say about our nature as human beings um, could be true without that fundamental basis. Um, um, uh, that's bland reductionism, and it's clearly correct. You know, ultimately, what we are um, uh, uh, and how we function as human beings depends upon that biological basis, which in turn depends on the biochemical basis, which in turn depends on the physical basis. Um, but it doesn't follow from that that everything that can be said and needs to be said about human beings can be said in the language of particle physics or in the language of biochemistry and, and genetics or in the language of um, 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 neuroscience or in the language of evolutionary biology. 